So friends, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, you are come to the workshop on doing using online resources to do Quaker research. Our guest today is Mary Crotteroff from Haverford College. I'm going to let her introduce herself some more and tell you more about what's in store for today. I just want to say thank you on behalf of LEYM for making time for us today. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Mary. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I um, I'm, It's so great to, to be with you all today. Um, so um, my name is Mary Crowderoof and I'm the curator of Quaker Collections at Haverford College, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Lenni Lenape. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, have a presentation for you all today. Um, Oops, Zoom likes to do funny things sometimes. So let me just get situated. Um, so yes, um, today's agenda, um, we have a couple of things to talk about today. Um, and my goal is that we have plenty of time to uh, look at examples on site and to, um, to answer lots of questions. So, but the first thing I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna talk about the overview of U United States Quaker archives generally, um, and then talking about visiting Philadelphia Quaker archives in person. So that's Haverford College and Swarthmore College's repositories and how to make requests for copies. Um, then I'm gonna talk about a couple different online resources that are available, um, including one of the biggest ones that's available, which is ancestry.com, has over 11 million Quaker records available. Um, and I will talk about how to access that and different things like that. And then we'll have plenty of time for conversation and questions and, um, and everything like that. So um, yes, again, thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. Um, so the, there are five quick major Quaker repositories in the United States. There are many more, and there are many archives that have um, Quaker, um, Quaker materials, but are not necessarily, but not necessarily a ton of them. So um, we have, um, I'll talk about the five major ones today. So uh, you have Guilford College, which is situated in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, um, and they collect the American South and Southeast. Um, Earlham College, which is out in Richmond, Indiana, my alma mater, and um, collects um, sort of the, the Midwest and, um, and, and more Western United States. Um, I imagine that Lake Erie's repository might be at Earlham, but I did not check that ahead of time. Um, and then you have up in, in Massachusetts, you have um, the, um, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, which is the major repository for New England Yearly Meeting. They have a couple of different a couple of different repositories, but that's the main one. Um, then we travel to Philadelphia. So uh, the Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College is just outside Philadelphia and um, collects predominantly Hicksite and post-reunification Philadelphia and Baltimore yearly meeting material and all of New York yearly meeting. Um, and then if you travel six miles over, um, then you get to the place where I work at Haverford College Quaker and Special Collections, also just outside of Philadelphia. And we collect more Orthodox and pre-separation Philadelphia and Baltimore yearly meeting material. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about visiting Philadelphia Quaker archives in person and how to request copies of materials from them. Um, other of the, of the archives will be similar. Um, and the biggest takeaway in this section is to go to the website or to call the organization and ask the best way to make a copy because every place is just slightly different. So, and um, as I mentioned, I have a handout that I will post at the end of my presentation. I'll, I'll post it in the chat and I think it can get posted somewhere else. Um, and this will have all of the links that you'll need. So the France Historical Library, um, currently they require appointments for visit for on-site visits, and they prefer to have approximately two weeks notice to prepare, but they can usually fit you in um, 
in earlier if if you if you need. Um, and in terms of doing reproductions, um, if you go to their website, they have a form that you can fill out and um, they are able to do about a hundred um, PDF copies um, per researcher. So um, at Haverford, we um, have, we just, re I say just in, uh, in September, 2019, which feels like just, we opened, um, uh, we opened, um, actually, it was almost complete as McGill Library, but we reopened as Lutnick Library, and um, we do require, we also require appointments ahead of time. Um, most of our campus is still key card access only because of COVID precautions, so, um, so we, we welcome everyone, but we just require a little bit of advance notice so that we can get you in our system. We have um, increased our photocopy um, um, request limit. Um, it used to be closer to sophomores, and now we can do about 500 pages um, per year per researcher. So um, that is also something, there's a link on our website and um, you can fill out a, a Google form and, um, and we will kind of, we'll get to your requests as soon as we're able to. So for either place, you know, as I said, you know, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're used to talking to people all the time. Um, with questions about these things. So we're very happy to, to talk with you about um, your research and um, about how to make copies. Um, there are two places that um, you can visit online to learn more about what materials we do have at our repositories, one of which is our book catalog and the other is our manuscripts finding aid. Um, both of these are combined catalogs for, um, we have three colleges in our consortium, Bryn Mawr, Haverford, and Swarthmore, and together we make, we call ourselves the TriCo. So you'll see a lot of TriCo or Tri, um, our, um, our book catalog is Tripod. So here is a little bit small, but hopefully you can see, um, I've done a search for Rufus Jones, and on the left in the highlighted part, um, you can choose, you can refine your search um, by location and subject term. And it's a good way to see if the book that you're looking for is at Swarthmore or Haverford, for instance. Um, another tool that, um, that will be useful is um, on our finding aid website to, especially uh, depending what kind of research you're doing, um, but is the Quaker meeting collection. So Earlham and Guilford have similar sites, but today I'll walk us through the one for Haverford and Swarthmore, who are the code depositories, um, as I mentioned earlier, for Baltimore and Philadelphia yearly meetings and their constituents. This is this a finding aid database for Bryn Mawr, Haverford, and Swarthmore colleges, and you can search or browse our finding aids. So here's the landing page for the Quaker meeting records. And we're gonna use Philadelphia Yearly Meeting as an example. And I know that it's small, but it's just to kind of give you a sense of orientation so that when you go to it yourself, uh, you kind of recognize what it looks like. Um, here you can see um, the landing page. Um, um, so on um, a brief description of the yearly meeting and then um, on the right, you can see the subgroups. So the yearly meeting records and the constituent meetings. So the um, preparative monthly and quarterly meetings. If you click on the latter, then you'll get to this page. So this um, kind of gives you a brief description of what the types of meetings are. And it can be helpful to understand, you know, probably most of you are familiar with, but if you're not, the hierarchical organization of, of meetings generally. Um, and then there's the list of all of the meetings. So we're gonna use Abington Monthly Meeting as an example um, to understand what you might find in what we call a resource or a finding aid. So the center space of this page contains information about what records are available and in something we call the scope and contents section. 
It also outlines the historical information about the meeting and the sidebar on the right allows you to browse the finding aid to see what materials are available. Um, and with, you can see there are all these lots of little carrots next to each section. And um, if you click on one of them, then it'll open up um, all of the contents of what is inside um, each of those sections and we call them series. Um, and so what you'll notice when you look at this compared to what we look at on Ancestry, there's a lot more here because not everything was digitized for Ancestry, but there's certain, so um, if you are looking on Ancestry and realize that you wanna find, look at something that is here and not there, then we're happy to help make copies for you. Um, something that is helpful is under the meeting name is something called the identifier of the collection. And so that is helpful for when you talk to, um, to one of the repositories so that we can, can help you find. There are some meetings that have multiple collections for various reasons. Sometimes it's two meetings and they have the same name but are in different locations. Um, and so it's, that is a helpful, helpful number. Um, one thing that I would like to mention, um, it can be a little bit of a pain to open up each of the carrots and you can kind of see more information all at one time if you're looking at a PDF of the, um, of the finding aid. And to do that, there are two buttons and one of them, um, they're both in the top right corner. Um, sorry about that. In the top right corner of the page, um, you'll see one says citation and the other, other one says print and the citation button is very, very useful um, and can help you kind of figure out how to cite something for to make to keep track of it. Um, but the other one, um, it hopefully looks a little bit familiar to, to you. It's the Adobe symbol and it says print and what it's going to do is create a PDF and then you can open it and you can look at it on your computer or you can print it out however you would like. Um, and that can sometimes just be easier than opening and closing the carrots and everything like that. Next, I would like to talk about online resources shared by Haverford and Swarthmore. And the first is our digital collection site. And this launched um, a little over a year ago. And there are not as many specifically genealogy materials here. Um, but there are collections such as the In Her Own Right project with almost 10,000 images of materials focused on the women's rights movements from the 1850s through the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1918, for instance. And um, as you can see here in this list, um, the materials that are on the site vary by institutions, um, but include family papers, images of meeting houses, um, broadsides and pamphlets, organizational papers, materials on Quakers and indigenous groups, and also includes non-Quaker materials. A lot of our college archives have materials on the site. Next, I would like to talk about using Quaker materials that are available on ancestry.com. So there was a major project that was done with materials from Earlham, Guilford, Haverford, and Swarthmore Colleges, as you can see highlighted here. And I would like to state that much of my experience in this material and using Ancestry.com is based on my experience um, as a curator, um, but also working as a contractor for Ancestry, scanning Quaker materials for 18 months in 2012 to 2013. Um, Haverford decided and the other colleges decided to participate um, in this project as we are responsible for maintaining and making these, um, these records accessible and having them digitized is one way of making them accessible for more people. For the majority of the collections, materials were scanned from the beginning of the records available until 1935. There, are many yearly meetings that have at least some materials in this project. And right here, I'm focusing on US 
materials. There is some from um, Ireland and, um, and Britain as well um, and of the Quaker materials. So these materials include Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, Baltimore Yearly Meeting, Virginia Yearly Meeting, Primitive Yearly Meeting, North Carolina Yearly Meeting, Indiana Yearly Meeting, and Ohio Yearly Meeting. Scanning happened approximately between 2011 and 2014, leading to more than 11.5 million Quaker meeting records from the United States being added to Ancestry.com. And the major release of records happened in 2014. As you can imagine, this amount of digitization of materials is untenable for most of our smallish liberal arts colleges alone, or even if we were to do it as a consortium um, without a major um, organization like Ancestry. Um, so coming together this way and partnering with Ancestry was imperative for getting this amount of materials digitized. And being able to provide access to digitized versions of our collections has been an incredible resource, even behind the paywall of Ancestry. I can particularly speak from my experience at Haverford to the success of researchers, um, genealogists, historians, and many others who have used these, these collections. In particular, during the early stages of COVID-19, when my colleagues and I, um, when not just researchers, but my colleagues and I were unable to come to campus to use our collections or make copies of materials, we were able to point our researchers to Ancestry. There are several known issues with the material there, um, including metadata issues, with including the wrong title for the wrong information for for, um, for a, a, a real, and the fullness of the transcription is not necessarily what we thought it would be. Um, it does get better over time. Ancestry reruns their indices, um, but it's, it's not as much as we thought that it might be. Um, one question that I get a lot is about access to the collection and whether at some point we will put this material onto that other site that I showed you um, and make it freely accessible. And we do talk about what this might look like. However, there's so much content that it is likely un, um, it is unlikely to happen in the near future. And we do rely on um, either people's personal or institutional access and know that many public libraries in the United States um, provide access to ancestry, either at the local or state level. And so while it's complicated to have materials behind a paywall, I also feel good about, um, about the fact um, that people have this um, access to it. Um, we also, of course, are willing to share images with researchers who can't access ancestry any of those ways. Um, fortunately for our staff time, that has been minimal. Um, now I would like to show you how to find um, the Quaker project databases and show some examples of the databases within it. When you're on the homepage of Ancestry, you can um, so you can start on um, on you, there's a, a search button at the top here, and you click that, and then you click card catalog. From there, you type in Quaker and then search. 76 collections will appear in your search, give or take. And um, many of these resources um, are, um, are harder or impossible to find digitized anywhere else. And some of these are um, items that, that are not available in a digital form anywhere else or and they're not, there's not a lot of copies of them in, in other locations, um, such as the, um, the Hinshaw Indices and the Haberford College Necrology Collection. So let's explore these two databases to see what, what they do. So there are two databases available. One is the index cards of Hinshaw's original work, and the other is digitized versions of the volumes created by him you can browse or search either one. Here is a set of books called by its formal name, Encyclopedia of American Quaker Genealogy. So if you look up, um, let's look up one of these books. Let's go to volume two. This is the cover page 
let's jump to page 100. One of the great things with this collection is that it is transcribed. So if we click on the bottom, there's a little person symbol and we can find the transcribed names with the event date as they appear in the book. And if you click on a specific person's name and then on the arrow and line symbol on the left or on the right, sorry, um, you can see more contextual information about them. So this is just helpful to see it in a larger form. Now we're going to explore a collection from Haverford. Um, if you've ever done research with us, you may have referred to, heard it referred to as the Necrology Index and Ancestry calls it the Index to Quaker Obituary Notices. This is a card catalog of obituary notices collated from 11 journal, Quaker journals from 1822 to about 2013. Like other databases, you can search within it or browse the collection. The, date rate, the ranges of um, these image sets might look really arbitrary, and that's because this was a, card, a literal card catalog, and so each set is a card catalog drawer. One thing to note is that the year of the obituary or the notice may be different than the death year of the person that you're looking for due to publishing dates. So for instance, in this example, let's search for Lucretia Mott. There are two cards for her. The first one is for her death notice. The publication um, year for her death notice is 1881, even though she died in 1880. The second one is a poem in her memory, which was published in Friends Intelligencer in 1885. So the collection that we'll explore a little more deeply is the US Quaker Meeting Records 1681 to 1935 collection. Like the others, this can be browsed or searched. The materials that were scanned include yearly, quarterly, monthly, and preparative records from 1681 to 1935, including births, deaths, burials, marriages, marriage certificates, minutes, both men's and women's and combined, some extracts and indices, remove certificates of removal, both issued and received, and membership records. Some records of ministers and elders or overseers committees were also digitized. This depends a bit on what was available to be digitized and what the then curators decided that they wanted to include in this project. I want to be clear about a few things, particularly um, with regard to transcription. The goal for Ancestry was to transcribe names and usually only in instances where the name was associated with typically genealogy work. So searching subject terms is not going to be very helpful. So if you wanna use this research to search, you know, we've had a lot of people ask us what their meeting was doing. Um, for instance, with uh, the, um, the flu pandemic of 1918. So looking up influenza in this database is not going to be very helpful for you. You're gonna to have to browse the records themselves. Um, and also relying solely on the search for names is not going to be perfect. Um, as I said, um, it's, it's just not, every single name is not transcribed every single time. Um, so let's continue. We can take take a look at what this might mean. Um, let's you continue to use friend Lucretia as our example. When we search for her in this database, there are 320 results. So let's see if there's anything interesting here. Well, first of all, Lucretia Mott died in 1880. So what is she doing in a record from 1914? Let's find out. It seems that Germantown monthly meeting outside of Philadelphia had a children's tea meeting every year. And in 1914, the children dressed up in costumes as George Fox, William Penn, Francis Daniel Pastorius, Margaret Fell Fox, Lucretia Mott, and Elizabeth Fry. Well, that's our answer. It's both, 
is both after she, she died and is not related to genealogy. So the, the good lesson here is that, um, that context is key. And so really going in and understanding, we can't take everything, you really have to look at it all. So let's look, um, let's take a look. There's in 1818, here is a, um, here's a removal for Lucretia Mott. So this is um, from Philadelphia Monthly Meeting, requesting a certificate for Lucretia and James to the Western District Meeting. And one, one tool that is helpful um, is this one um, that I mentioned before, next to the page jump, the little person icon. And again, this reveals all of the uh, transcribed names on that page. So one of the best parts about this collection is the ability to fully browse volumes and documents. So really when I say context is key, this is where you get your context. Um, so this is really great, but it can also prove frustrating due to the metadata um, issues that I mentioned earlier about some of the titles being imperfect. So um, the first issue, um, even though they were given the correct metadata, a large percentage of the titles are mislabeled. So I would like to right click on a title, as you can see highlighted here, and open it in a new tab or window for easier browsing. Um, the back button that they have um, can sometimes jump to a place you don't want it to go. And um, so opening the reel in a new tab or window means you can easily get back to this landing page without losing track of it. Another issue is that some meetings are under multiple counties. You can see here it goes by meeting state and then county and then monthly meeting. Um, and so it doesn't quite follow the same structure, hierarchical structure of Quaker meetings. So sometimes meetings are in different counties. Um, and so you might have to look under different counties in order to find all the materials related to that one meeting. There's really no easy fix around this one. And so you just have to take your time and try not to get too frustrated and search the various places. Let's take a look at a book of minutes from Philadelphia yearly meeting, monthly meeting. So when you're browsing, um, instead of being sent to the middle of the, of the volume like we did before, we will get sent to the beginning of the volume or reel is what they call it. When, um, so you might wanna confirm the, um, the volume that you're in. And so you might wanna flip a, a few pages ahead. This volume I know has an index. So I'm going to jump to where the minutes begin. So oftentimes with minutes, there's going to be a title page, but if there isn't, um, you will hopefully at least get confirmation of what you were looking at, like in this book, while the ancestry title says minutes 1809 to 1828, the book starts thusly. At a monthly meeting of Friends of Philadelphia, held fifth month, 28th, 1818. So, as you can see, working with this collection will not always be easy or simple, but it is hopefully well worth your time for the content that is available. While we're here, let's talk about some of the tools available to us. At the bottom of the page, you can do three things. One, you can jump to various pages by typing a page number into the page X of Y space. In this instance, we are on page 33 to 442. Two, you can pull up a list of the transcribed names and potentially other contextual information um, about the event that they are listed under. And three, you can pull up a film strip to quickly browse through the reel to see contextually where you are in it. On the side, you can do several things from top to bottom. You can make the page full screen to see it bigger, you can open up a side tab, um, as we saw earlier, to um, uh, in the tra transcribed form, such as this marriage intention of Jane Claypool. You must click on a name in the bottom part in order to pull up this information in the sidebar. 
You can also open up the tools bar to print or download or rotate the image if it's not working for you, um, or you can invert the colors if it's hard to read, um, and there's some other settings there. You can also zoom in on um, the image to, to read it better. Um, next, I, <laughs> I ruined my own joke. Uh, next, I would like to show you generally how to generally search in Ancestry and use the facets to see if there are Quaker records in your search. We're going to go to the beginning. Wrong beginning. Let's try that again. Okay, so we're back to Ancestry, back to the homepage, and here you can either click the all categories or the begin searching button, and we'll put in some information for our friend Lucretia. So here we can put in some information and we get over 8,000 results. And I don't know about you, but I'm certainly not going to spend that much time looking at every single record. So, um, and we can sort of, sort of see that potentially at the bottom there, there's something from the Quaker meeting records um, that's available, but let's use one of the filters on the side to see if we can get more Quaker meeting records for us to view. Um, so in when we do that, there's, uh, you can't quite see it here, um, but there's only a couple of thousand results. And you can see, as I've highlighted, that there are more of the Quaker meeting records um, that are apparent. Um, another tool, um, so this kind of wraps up the major kind of walkthrough of Ancestry. Um, but another tool that I have um, that I've worked on and worked with some, some colleagues on is a research guide on Quaker genealogy. And this is definitely on the handout that I have for you. And it explains a lot of what I've gone over today and actually includes a talk. Uh, you can basically, I know that, that today's talk is being recorded, but it's also, I have another one on that site. So you can walk through it again if that is helpful to you. Um, I'm also happy to receive feedback that will help guide, um, help the guide for other users and other researchers. So if there's something that's either very helpful for you or not at all, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and um, I am always available to help. Here I am with friend Lucretia um, at Friends Historical Library when I went there on a visit a few months ago. So just like I came today, I'm also available to come to your historical society, your you know, genealogy group or other group to walk them through this as well, um, as well as I'm very happy to send the link to the, um, uh, to the talk that I give, the, the pre-recorded talk. So um, that is the end of my formal presentation. And I would love to, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for the moment and um, we can have um, more of a conversation and I can answer questions or bring up things on Ancestry directly. Um, so um, yeah, are there, um, are there questions that I can, can answer? It's so great to have so many of you here today. I see Mary has her hand up. <clears throat> sure, yes. You have to unmute yourself, Mary. Mary, I, I'd like you to say again where the where the one library is that you started with. Which school is that at? The one. The first one. Friends Library, not McGill, uh, but the other one. Uh, Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College. This is Swarthmore. Mm -hmm. uh, and my second question is um, not having anything to do with. Ancestry, but actually searching records at Swarthmore or Haverford. I'm interested in getting into the early minutes of Lake Erie yearly meeting. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I'm interested in the um, in finding out whether they supported the boarding schools. Mm -hmm. So that's something I would I would first locate where Lake Erie yearly meetings early records are, and then I could search it. Yes, and it does actually look as though um, Lake Erie yearly meeting records are at Swarthmore, and 
you all have been wonderful. It seems like there's materials going um, from 1934 to 2021. So most places are not that recent. Um, I'm putting the link to it in the chat. Um, and I'm sure that, that the folks there would be more than happy also to talk with you about it. Um, but you can kind of browse that and see um, here. I'll, sh I'll just share my screen. Um, and so you can see what that looks like. So you can see here at the top oh. is the yearly meeting materials. Oh, uh -huh. um, and then um, and then by the by the monthly meetings and quarters. Um, you know, pr I don't think that these are going to be on Ancestry, yet, so we don't know if they're otherwise digitized. Um, so it would definitely be something um, worth talking to the um, the um, the librarians and archivists okay. at the Historical Library. Um, okay. And I'm trying to attach. I'm trying to do two things at once. Um, I'm trying to attach this. Um, uh, let me just drop my. Um, oh, I do have it in here. Um, I I want to give you all the the handout. Um, oh, I can't just attach something. Um, yeah, we don't have that activated right now. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Let me just, um, I'll just make a public link to it in my, in my drive. And then you all can also, I'll maybe, um, maybe I can send it to someone to post it um, as well. Um, and another question, well, yes. well, if it's still my turn. Um, it's my understanding that the records really still belong to us and, and we can ask for them back if we wanted to do something with them or research them. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, usually, um, usually the process is that you need a minute from whatever meeting they are from to, in order to take them out. Um, so that would be a discussion to have with, um, with Friends Historical Library. But okay. yes, they are still yours. I sent very early records from Toledo Friends mm -hmm. to Swarthmore several years ago. Um, I, I don't particularly want them, but someone might. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is that um, they're on deposit and um, and so they are, but they're being kept in perpetuity that way. And so there's no concern that they won't be, you know, won't be kept safe at Friends Historical Library for the, for the duration. Um, yeah, are there, are there other questions? Let's see, um, Roberta, <laughs> is that you? Yes. My, my image in my hand is going in different directions. <laughs> um, I had a couple of questions, actually. Um, I'm currently doing some research on the abolitionist friends of the Indiana yearly meeting. <laughs> and I'm assuming that their records and any diaries and so on are probably at Earl, Earlham College. It, do you know if that's correct or not? I've because of COVID, I've yet to make my way over there. Yeah, yeah, the majority of those records are gonna be held at Earlham. Okay, and mm -hmm. when you say the majority, are there some others that are maybe at the museum or do you know? Um, I just don't wanna say that they hold every single thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> they, um, Probably, okay. Yes, um, but... Um, I will put the link to, to them um, in the chat. Um, there is a question in the chat that came from Martha. Have yearly meeting faith and practice books been digitized, providing a way to see changes over time? That's a fabulous question. Um, and that was not part of this, this project. Um, I believe that there are that there is um, like a non-archival um, resource online that somebody did of doing some of that work. Um, and also a lot of them are available on a site called Hottie Trust. 
which I will put a link to in the chat. Um, and this is an organization that it's a huge digital library. And so you can search for faith and practices there and see what they have. Um, I but think University have, of Michigan okay. subscribes to that. Awesome. Yeah. So if you belong with them and you can get a ton without even being subscribed. So just um, just as a as a public member or as a, as a member of the public without logging in. Um, but so that can also be a great resource for you. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, Bob, what's your question? Got, <clears throat> I've got actually two things. A woman right before me talked about Indiana yearly meeting. My recollection without checking is that at one point there were two different Indiana yearly meetings like FUM and FGC or something like that. And one of them changed names possibly to Ohio Valley, but I'm not sure. So doing historical research, you might need to know that to find which one you're talking about. And I also just wanna mention in my local North Columbus meeting, we're talking about how or if to preserve previous versions of documents that change over time or to keep only the most recent version. And I saw one of the questions about um, providing a way to see changes over time. So I'm just commenting that that's part of our current discussion at North Columbus. Yeah, well, and one of, one of the big things that's changed is that membership records used to be like a handwritten thing. And now that it's all online, you know, people's addresses, like things just kind of get written over. Um, and so if you don't have a printed out copy or like, do you save it at a different interval? Um, and I'd be happy to talk with you about those sorts of logistics if you're, um, if you're interested um, of that. Um, and I see someone says, um, yes, another great, great idea is GitHub provides versioning on the back end for collaborative text documents. So, um, in, yes, as I understand coders who steal from coders um, who work all day with text files, that that's a very common thing. Um, but that's a great way of kind of keeping different versions um, of things as well. Um, let's see. Um, uh, that another question, I'm just gonna hop into the chat from Roberta. Um, on the Tri-College webpage, there was a link to African-American genealogy. Um, Oh, I think that that was in the lib guide. Um, and that was specific to um, materials that are at Haverford and at Swarthmore. Um, so um, some of it is general information and some of it is specific about figures, which may not actually answer your question, but if you go to the website, you can explore it. I'm okay, sure. thank you. Sure. Um, Tom, what's your question? Oh, it, it's really a very general question. Um, about the scope of digitizing. Um, it, so it just in general, should one assume that um, most ancient meeting records, which might include um, births, marriages, and deaths, um, were um, imaged in their entirety? for Ancestry.com, and should we expect that all of the page images are there, whether they have been um, um, optical character recognition read uh, in order to find names or not? And then um, corresponding question for what's um, digitally imaged, but not in Ancestry.com. Is there any corpus of material in that state or not? Sure. Okay. So anything that was digitized by Ancestry that is before 1935 should be available in its whole on Ancestry, right? Um, so there should not be anything that's like redacted or anything like that um, if it's before 1935. So um, so that I think answers that part of your question. Um, and I also wanna add that these were not optical recognitions, um, like it's not computer optical. These are humans transcribing 
um, because handwriting is really, really difficult. Like it's basically impossible for computers to read um, and transcribe that way. So, um, so these are were actually done by by humans. Um, so, just want to add add that piece. Um, and then, in terms of what is available, um, that that is not an ancestry but has been digitized or so what we have more of right now are digital records that meetings are submitting currently so in the past like 10 years or so um, that we have meetings that are submitting materials um, in digital form because they were born digital and so that's how we're preserving them um, there's not like a corpus of material that is not an ancestry and is digitized somewhere of Quaker meeting records. Um, you know, as I pointed out that other the digital collection site that we have as a trico is not really um, Quaker meeting records. It has like all of these other all the other things on it, like family papers and diaries and college archival material. Does that make sense? Um, but family papers and diaries, which have been digitized or um, yes. are simply yes. indexed. Which have um, been digitized. Which have been digitized. Mm -hmm. And then are there more um, family papers and di diaries um, which are indexed but not digitized? No, standard, we use the index. So we have so we, standard we have, manuscript collections. So we have a lot of manuscript collections that are not digitized at all. I'd say, so the, out of our non-Quaker meeting materials, the amount of material that's digitized, if it was my hand, like a portion of my pinky would be, would be digitized. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and Bill put in the chat um, a great PDF from Ancestry that kind of goes over a bit more, goes over in some detail as well about um, Quaker meeting, um, Quaker records that they have um, and how to do that research there. But um, Susan, what's your question? Um, need to, uh, yes. Ah, um, if I have any Quaker ancestors at all, they maybe have originated in Britain. Is there a college? Um, I know I, t I started a um, a course on future learn that was um, oh gosh Bill I can't remember the where it came out of but um, is there a college that um, has similar kinds of records or maybe even more than one? Um, so what you're, the resource that you're going to look at is Friends Library in London and I'm going to pop the link to them in the chat um, and. One of the things that happened in England was that the materials got more dispersed than they are in the US, that they got dispersed to the counties as opposed to having like Quaker repositories in the same way that we have them here. There are some places that have more records than others and Friends House um, or Friends Library is going to be the place to go. They're the ones that hold you know, a ton of material and we'll be able to guide you in that way. Are there other questions? I'll, I'll ask again, if I may. Um, sure. er, early on, describing the manuscript collections, you mentioned um, capability to produce photocopies um, in, in limited quantity. Um, does that capability extend to um, making PDF copies rather than, meaning electronic images rather than paper images? All of our copies are, are PDF copies. Ah, thank you. So Mary, I'm wondering about uh, if somebody is just beginning to explore their Quaker history, 
Do you have any suggestions about, do you just start with your own last name or what would be the, the path you might walk to begin to, to dig in? Look, looking for an ancestor you've heard of or um, wh where might you start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would, I would definitely start, you know, if, um, if you have, if there's always been that family member that someone has talked about, like, oh, this family member was Quaker. Um, I know a lot of people have come to Quaker meetings because they were not raised Quaker, but um, they heard that an ancestor was Quaker. So I would start with that person and put their name into ancestry and to start digging around that way. Um, um, and that would be a kind of a, a good way to, to start. Um, you know, when you kind of dig in a little bit, then you kind of find like, oh, there are different Quaker names and you can kind of start to find the, the trees. Um, one thing that we have at Haverford um, is we have a lot of genealogy books. And so if you're like, oh, and I now I, I find that I, I'm in Evans, but there are like five different Quaker Evans families. Um, and so, you know, we can help you with that. Um, we have about 25,000 um, books that circulate. Um, and so also you can request those books from, um, from our, through like your public library or your university. Um, and so those also, um, could be helpful to kind of understand more of the context of that Quaker family. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I see Valerie's got a hand up. Yeah. Hi, um, um, for the person who asked about changes in faith and practice. A number of years ago, Quaker Heritage Press put out a volume titled The Old Discipline, which was a very early um, Philadelphia yearly meeting, Faith and Practice, and it tracked the changes since then. So Quaker Heritage Press might be a resource. Yeah. Um, and let me see if I can find um, this. Th there was a site for a while, and I'm not sure if it still exists. Um, But it did have, it had like all these, you could choose like all these different faith and practices and it had a whole bunch of different ones. Um, I'm not sure that I can find it right off the cuff, but if you search around a little bit, you might be able to find it. Um, and if you're interested in a particular yearly meeting um, and how, like, if you're interested in, you know, Lake Erie, for instance, um, then um, you can contact, you know, one of the Quaker colleges, we're going to have those. And we can either, you know, look at the pages of what you're looking for, or if it's a larger project, you know, we can definitely help you with that. So definitely be in touch um, if, if you'd like. Um, yeah. Um, Bob, you have another question. Yeah, I'm suddenly trying to figure out is ancestry.com, do they list the religious affiliations? Like if I were looking for a Mennonite near Bluffton, Ohio, could I type in their name, John Miller in Allen County, and then it would say Mennonite on, on the ancestry.com um, website? That's a great question. Let's find out. Now, John Miller is an imaginary Mennonite. That's not necessarily a real person. There's probably hundreds of them. Let's let's see what we can do. Um, if we begin searching, basically, so you're going to want to show more options, and well, let's see. Um, let's look up. I know there are a bunch of a bunch of, of shanks that are Mennonites. So let's look in the keyword and see if that shows us anything. So what's hard to know, I mean, there's, you know, over 2 million because we didn't even put a first name in there. Um, let's see. And we also will make it exact. Um, sometimes, so one of the things that you can do with Ancestry is if you're not exactly sure how a name is spelled, then you could have it be more or less exact in that spelling. Um, mm. but so, um, you know, here's a whole bunch 
now here's more more shanks. So um, when you go to so when you go to it's interesting because um, when you go to the home and then click search. Oh, why is it? Okay, we're just gonna jump to the, okay, so we're gonna jump to the one that I know. We're gonna jump to this collection. So what's interesting is that in this Quaker meetings, like in this portion, I can select, like I can say religion sect. Okay. So we can would, say like fine. Orthodox or Hicksite, or I could say what yearly meeting, but in terms of like putting in, you would think that they would do that because that's some, like people are really, really interested in finding their genealogy from going from that lens. So really great question. Um, yeah, yeah, Bill. I'm uh, may maybe interested in Quaker gossip a little too much, but uh, <laughs> people are, are run out of meetings for a variety of reasons, right? Yeah. And Ancestry kept track of all that or that was part of the collection that was was digitized? Well, so that would be like in a removal that there might be information about that. Um, that would be where you would look um, or generally in the minutes. Um, that's also possibly in um, like the um, um, ministers and elders committee minutes or something like that. I have a, a relative reported from my family history, Lydia Dara, who was a Philadelphia friend who supported the Revolutionary War by warning Washington of an attack on Valley Forge. And she was run out of her meeting for taking a position on the war. Wow, and that's really, I was literally just talking to a class in California yesterday um, and they were kind of wondering about if any Quakers support, like how Quakers supported the revolution or anything like that, so. Well, yeah. she ended up with the Free Quakers, which is a different group that lasted for a little while in, in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'd be interested to see what they wrote about her when they were kicking her out. Yeah, well, did, she, <laughs> did she ever go back in or no? She just was, she just was like, no, she left. <laughs> Don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you what I what I have found, you know, just going through a lot of records, not necessarily on ancestry, but I find um, you there are like little scraps of paper that are from so like there'll be a couple that has stated their intention to be married. Um, and then like their parents will have each sign said like, you know, our daughter, you know, so and so um, intends to marry so and so and we approve. Very interesting sort of gossipy things like that. Um, but yeah. I guess, are there other people who are interested in Quaker gossip? Where do they congregate? <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Twitter is where they congregate. There are a lot of Quaker <laughs> historians on Twitter and they like to talk about the best Quaker names that they find in repositories um, and ask questions of each other. That that's a pretty pretty great place to be. How about I got a couple of good Quaker names? Can you think of any off the top? Um, I mean, if I literally there was literally my friend Isabella just posted. Um, my friend Isabella Rosner um, does she does work um, in like women's work particularly, um, and things like needlework and things like that. So she does some very intricate things mm -hmm. and uh, she just posted today, early good, or, uh, good early Quaker names in the archive today. Patience Rawbone, Squire Boone, Sherlock Thorpe, Dykes Alexander. So there you go. Um, Thank you so much. Sure, Susan. This is not so much a question, it's just another sort of story to share on Bill's <laughs> line. That um, I got very excited when I was doing genealogy maybe 10 years ago and discovered that my great great however many grandmother Charity Beeson was presumably a granddaughter of Isaac Pennington. And I said, oh, oh wow. 
And now when I look online at Ancestry.com, there are historians, genealogists from Harborford and Swarthmore saying, no, her mother, Rachel Pennington, was not the daughter of Isaac Pennington. She's some other Pennington. So I've lost my, lost my uh, <laughs> connection there. The, these things happen. And I will say, we one of the hard things um, is that a lot of, you'll find a lot of the same Quaker names. And when you have a slightly larger Quaker family um, that lives in the same place, you have, um, a lot of people that are named the same names. So you'll have people of similar generations um, or slightly different generations with the same name. So you might, Jonathan Evans is a great one because there are still Jonathan Evans today, um, but that goes back to the 1700s. And so you might have like an uncle and a nephew that are both Jonathan Evans, both in the Philadelphia area and maybe both in the same or similar um, yearly meeting or um, monthly meeting and their dates might just be slightly off. <laughs> um, and so that makes doing genealogy really, really hard. And sometimes it makes it hard to identify, like you just have to do some more digging um, into, um, in, into your, um, your, your family there, but yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Uh, I saw Patricia's hand go yeah. up. Yeah, I, I can never find the hand raise thing. For some reason, I get, you know, other other strange icons. I put up a cat the other day because I couldn't find anything. Um, I've traced my family back in ancestry, but other family members did a lot of work on it also so I knew what I was looking for which made it easy to find them but it goes all the way back to the 1700s in Balderton England and I come from nine generations of Quakers named Pennell wow. and my my cousin Greg has done a lot of research and for some reason he doesn't seem to be able to tell me where he's finding these tidbits but we have ancestors in the Philadelphia area who are read out of meeting for public inebriation mm. and read out of meeting for playing music for Saturday night dances, which is the one I'm particularly proud of. Absolutely. But oh. also starting from the UK, they're all named Joseph, Elizabeth, Hannah, Margaret. It just goes generation. It's like six generations of them with all yeah. the same name. All the same names and boy yeah. when you get into ancestry it's like near, 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 near. especially oh. when you're following other people's records that may or may not be accurate yes and that is something especially on ancestry you know you can find other people that have done similar work but they you know whether how much you trust that is really up to you and you might yeah. want to do your own research but it can at least sometimes be a starting place um you know, sometimes by the time that people call us for genealogy questions, they're like, I've been doing genealogy on our family for 15 years and I need to find this one person. And I'm like, I probably won't help you be able to help you find that person <laughs> because if you've been doing searching for that long, then it's probable that we won't be able to find anything. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you just never know. Um, we might have them somebody might have the missing puzzle piece for you. But, yeah. yeah, it's it's been interesting, yeah. especially since my daughter talked us all into throwing our DNA in there. Absolutely. And uh, it, haven't, haven't found any Quaker surprises that way, but we did find that my mother's cousin, David, that's the non-Quaker side of the family, um, made us a secret cousin that I, I think he didn't even know about her. <clears throat> and and we found her via her d DNA. And it's just amazing to me because I loved her dad, mm -hmm. who she never knew. Yeah. And she looks just like him. So yeah, I'm putting her together. Should I pause the recording? <laughs> and heirlooms to take over. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a common story with ancestry. So um, kind of yeah, not, not, not an unheard of thing at all. I see Pam has a hand up. Yeah, Pam. Hi, I was just wondering um, if the digital collection now includes like the old um, issues of Friends Intelligencer, which was before the Friends Journal. 
and if it's if you can do searches digitally with those um, issues. Great question. So Ancestry scanned some journals. I can't remember if Friends Intelligencer was in there. I'm going to check. They have a Quaker periodicals section. It, it was on the page heading of the Lucretia Mott poem. Yes. So there is a little bit there. But um, the other place that I would send you is, is Hottie Trust. And I put that link in, in the chat earlier. Oh, okay. and, Hot, and I believe that Hottie has a more com complete version of it um, than I think I might have pulled the actual image of the Friends Intelligencer from uh, an image from Hottie. So um, and not, not from Ancestry, um, but that is where, where okay. I would go. Um, there's more places, things like like journals, um, other places, University of Michigan and Harvard are two major contributors to that. And so, um, and they have a lot of these Quaker materials. So, um, yeah. And did you say- that, Would that be helpful? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did you say that um, UMass Amherst did not participate in Ancestry.com? And so the New England yearly meeting records are mostly not in ancestry.com? Right, so that that actually, so um, the records of New England yearly meeting uh, changed hands. Um, they got moved from, I believe, the Rhode Island Historical Society um, just like four or five years, like, like it was fairly, within the last like eight years, um, they moved to UMass. And so they were not part, part of that consortial um, process. Um, they have been doing their own digitization of the yearly meeting records, um, but they are not on Ancestry. Is it true that you can get a, a temporary, like a free Ancestry trial period? Because I think it used to be you could get I'm like two weeks can. or a month or something like that. I'm guessing that you can, to be quite honest, when I worked for them, they gave me a free account and then I have been at Haverford. So, um, and I use our institutional access. So I haven't needed a free trial in a while, but I believe that you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Susan McEwen. A uh, light bulb went off when you said you use uh, institutional access. Um, when I worked in our medical library, um, I was able to access things through them that I would have to pay for otherwise. Is that the same as someone visits the um, Haverford Library, for instance, they can use that access, institutional license? Yeah, so if, so if you're in our reading room doing other research, um, it's based on our IP. So when you're sitting in our reading room, then you're able to access all sorts of things that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I know our, our public library in Ann Arbor has institutional access if you're using an Ann Arbor computer, and I imagine others do too. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, I love public libraries. <laughs> that's one of the really great things. Um, and so, um, you know, I know that they have some restrictions on it, but you can't, it's not like a personal one. So like, you're not gonna be able to like save your family tree in it, but you certainly can do research in it um, is my understanding of a lot of those, that access. Seems like we might be winding down here. Are there any final questions before we look at wrapping up? Thank you for all these resources. This is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really been fascinating. I I decided, oh, what the heck, I'll drop in. And <laughs> so glad that you did. And um, hopefully there are some people that might not have been able to come today, but are able to view the video. Um, and I'm, of course, happy to take questions from anybody at any point. Um, I, my email address was in the, um, in the slides there, um, and I can put it in the chat. 